Well, welcome to our channel here at Questioning Christianity for another episode of our conversation series. If you're brand new to our channel, our real heartbeat is to help you connect the Christian story to life's deepest questions. And these conversations are really an opportunity to invite an expert onto the channel to be able to address the questions that everyone's thinking about and the questions that really matter. And today you're in for a real treat because we have a special guest joining us all the way from the US, a world famous philosopher of religion, Dr. William Lane Craig. Bill, it's great to have you on the channel. Thank you. Good to be with you. So great. And uh, Bill, maybe a lot of our friends in our audience, they haven't come across you before. So let me just spell out a couple of things that I've really appreciated. Uh, I've got a ton of your books sitting over here in my library, things that help to wrestle with arguments for God's existence as a philosopher. Uh, watch a ton of videos over the last 15 years or so of maybe some of the more famous debates that you've done uh, with secular thinkers. You know, I think it was Sam Harris that said that you're the one Christian apologist who puts the fear of God in his, to his fellow atheists in terms of that front. Um, but just for everyone who's, who's listening, um, would you like maybe in 60 seconds or so just to spell out a bit of your own story? Well, I became a Christian uh, my junior year in high school, um, and as a baby Christian, went off to Wheaton College in the Chicago area. Wheaton is a Christian liberal arts institution, and the priceless gift that Wheaton gave to me was the integration of my faith and my learning. I discovered that as a Christian, I didn't need to put my brains in one pocket and my faith in the other pocket and never let them see the light of day at the same time. But rather, I could have a Christian worldview, a Christian perspective on philosophy, on the sciences, on the arts, on history, and so forth. And it was at Wheaton that I formed the vision of sharing the gospel with students in the context of giving an intellectual defense of the Christian faith. And so it was that formative education at Wheaton that charted the course for the ministry that I now pursue. Yeah, and, and for anyone, uh, that ministry is called Reasonable Faith, and you can jump on their website. We'll make sure to put links all down in the show notes. But this is probably the book I think that, that might be most popular, uh, which is by the same title, Reasonable Faith, and that lays out a big part of your own sort of intellectual defense of the Christian faith, many of the arguments for God's existence that uh, you're, you're well known for, as well as in the particular arguments for the Christian story, why I think that Jesus reveals to us who God is. Uh, so, Bill, how about we dive then into the interview, because as soon as I put out on our social media channels with questions, in Christianity that uh, we're going to have you on. There was a flood of interest and questions, some more curiosity, some intellectual, some certainly more a bit more of a personal nature. And so I hope to get to hear more of your story as we, we piece that out today. Uh, maybe just to kick things off, um, you're uh, obviously very well achieved in the academic environment. Uh, I think there's a number of different lists in the last 10 years that have put you within the top 50 philosophers alive today. But I'm, I'm curious actually about your credentials, because you have two doctoral degrees, um, one in theology and then one in philosophy. That seems to be a fairly rare mix in terms of crossing those two disciplines. What sort of drew you down that line? Well, while I was at Wheaton, I studied both theology and philosophy, and after graduating, I decided to go on to pursue a degree in philosophy of religion, which really involves the interface of these two disciplines. And having completed that master's work in philosophy of religion, I went on to the University of Birmingham in England to study under Professor John Hick. Uh, mm -hmm. in philosophy, writing on the Kalam cosmological argument. And after I finished at uh, Birmingham, um, my wife asked me, well, what would you really like to do next? And I said, well, I, I guess I'd like to go to Germany and study with Wolfhard Pannenberg on the resurrection of Jesus. And we managed to, by God's grace, get a, a, a fellowship and so spent two years in Germany at the University of Munich uh, working with Professor Pannenberg on the historicity mm -hmm. of the resurrection. And by specializing in these two areas, I was able to develop I, what I think is a sound and persuasive argument for God's existence, but then also historical justification for believing that Jesus of Nazareth is God's special revelation to mankind as evidenced by God's raising him from the dead. 
Yeah, kind of these two big poles or steps within someone who might come from a secular background or just not really thinking about the religious questions. Then to coming to believe that God exists and that Jesus makes that God known, the more particular kind of claims of the Christian story. Uh, in terms of that relationship then between faith, this personal trust in God, and then reason or evidence and arguments as you've laid out in something like reasonable faith, how do these two things come together? And what's the whole uh, purpose of the relationship between sort of faith and reason, whether for someone who's not yet a Christian investigating Christianity or for Christians themselves? This is a profound question. And in my studied opinion, I think that there are sufficient arguments and evidence for the truth of the Christian faith. But I do not think that the arguments and evidence are necessary in order for Christian faith to be a rational and reasonable alternative. Um, I believe that through the inner witness of God's Spirit to our spirit, uh, every person can come to a reasonable uh, trust in Christ as his Savior and belief in God, even wholly apart from philosophical and historical arguments. So I see the Christian faith as having a kind of dual warrant, if you will. There's the interior warrant of the witness of God's Spirit, and then there is the external warrant afforded by the arguments and evidence. And so I invite people who are seekers and uh, considering Christian faith to explore both of those dimensions uh, of evidence for Christian faith. So in terms of looking at the arguments, but then also maybe being open to a search for God in a personal way, how do you explore? Exactly, both? exactly. To not just treat this as an intellectual um, quest, but to also recognize that this is a profoundly spiritual quest and to be open to an encounter with God, meeting him humbly uh, on his terms. I, I think that both the interior and the exterior approach uh, are important. So let's talk about some of the arguments then. Um, so when I was in the UK uh, doing a de degree there, I remember doing a couple of subjects in philosophy of religion, and your name came up in so many of the different articles that I was looking at. It was probably the subject matter at the time. But I'm, I'm curious, in, in all of the sort of vast work that you've done investigating classical arguments for God's existence in the philosophy of religion space. You've looked into sort of the history of Christianity and particularly dating right back as far as we can to try and identify where historical Adam and Eve questions come in. Um, you spent a lot of time on the resurrection of Jesus and the historical Jesus. I'm curious over the period of your study from your young faith coming to know Jesus and then growing in your understanding, have there been times where you've changed your mind? Because there's a perception, I think, that Christianity is closed-minded or that dogma drives a lot of the end results that Christians have to uh, ultimately hold on to, you know, doctrinal statements at, at seminaries. So do you find yourself that intellectual freedom to follow the evidence where it goes? And what might be one example where you've changed your mind? Yes, I have, and two examples come to mind. At one time in my philosophical career, I did not think that the argument for the existence of God from contingency is a sound argument. I thought that it was predicated upon what is called the principle of sufficient reason that was far too strong and even self-defeating. But then reading the work of a Christian philosopher named Stephen Davis persuaded me that, in fact, you could formulate the argument on the basis of a much more modest and plausible principle, and today I defend that more modest version of the argument. Another change would be that I was convinced that the ontological argument uh, was unsound until I read... Alvin Plantinga's book, The Nature of Necessity, in which Plantinga lays out a version of the ontological argument that I think is not only sound, but actually even uh, persuasive. So that would be two examples, yeah. um, major um, arguments where I, I have changed my mind. There you go. Uh, anyone who is maybe interested in an introduction for those sorts of arguments, would you recommend something like the two dozen or so Arguments for God volume that was put together in honor of Elvin Plantinga? 
Where would no, you go those that? are scholarly papers. Uh, for the beginner, I would recommend my book On Guard. Uh, this is a basic level primer for introducing people to the arguments. Now, unfortunately, it doesn't have the ontological argument in it because that argument struck me as too difficult, too abstract for the average man to understand. So it's not in On Guard, but that is discussed in my book, Reasonable Faith that you mentioned. Yeah, yeah so good places that people can pick that up. Um, on a more mm -hmm. personal level then, so to take it a little bit from ivory tower to everyday life, do you yourself ever experience doubt in your Christian faith? And maybe what might be some advice that you would give to a Christian who is really plagued by doubts at a time where culturally speaking, certainly in the online world, there is a ton of doubt and deconstruction and disillusionment. What would be your yeah. advice to those who are experiencing doubt? I think every person who holds to a position will have doubts about that position and will say, am I deceived? Am I deluded? Uh, is this really the truth? So that is a generic condition that atheists also experience. Um, and I think at that time, it's very helpful to review in your mind the arguments and evidence in support of that position. And I can testify in my own life, when I look at these arguments that I've defended for the existence of God, and particularly in debating them on university campuses, I come away from these encounters more persuaded than ever that these are good, sound arguments uh, and that the conclusions are, are true. Uh, so that can really be a boost. But then I would also emphasize to folks that, as I said earlier, this is not just an intellectual exercise. There's a spiritual warfare involved here, too. Uh, and therefore, I think a person needs to uh, go to the Lord with his doubts, to be honest with God, not try to paper them over, pretend they don't exist, but to mm. express them to God, to seek his face, uh, and to engage in spiritual disciplines like regular Bible reading and prayer and meaningful corporate worship and service uh, and evangelism. I think these practical spiritual exercises are very important in maintaining uh, a, a robust spiritual life. And I would just add also as well, cultivating the ethical virtues that go with the Christian faith. Um, mm. Goodness, uh, knowledge, um, a purity, and, and so forth. Many of these virtues are out of fashion today, but I think the Scripture assures that, us that, if, that if we will cultivate these kinds of virtues in our lives, then we will not fall away from the faith, but we will persevere. And, and it is the Christian who is living in sin, frankly, who is not living a virtuous life, who is farthest from God and most in danger, I think, of being overcome by doubt because he's in a condition of estrangement mm. from God. Mm. And I love the encouragement from Jesus' half-brother, James, too, uh, and Jude in and around themes of doubt and just recognizing mm -hmm. to uh, be shown mercy in those situations. And I, I love the the thought that, you know, behind every one of the questions that you often face in them with the Q&A environments that you have, uh, I've had this experience where I think the dominant questions behind every other thing that I'm asked usually is, is this true? Which is what you meet with facts and evidence and arguments in, in terms of yeah. assuaging that doubt, or is God good? And it's the questions about the character of God that seem to be a much more difficult for people to wade through. And uh, you know, we've just gone through the Easter weekend thinking back to how God makes himself known through Jesus and the, the love and character of Jesus on the cross. It's just, for yeah. me, that anchor of where I take a lot of my doubts around making sense of where God is in a world that seems really messy and, and painful. Um, to maybe you mentioned around the debates, uh, the internet is full of not only great memes of William Lane Craig, but uh, certainly great clips from many of the big debates that you've done with people like Sam Harris or Christopher Hitchens or the Oxford chemist Peter Atkins. Uh, I'm, I'm curious what place you think debates really have 
today, whether you could share maybe a couple of personal highlights and what role would debates play in the sort of contemporary scene? Why do you think it's worth engaging in now? I think the debates are the forum for evangelism on university campuses today. It became very clear to me early on that whereas a few score students might come out and hear me give a Christian talk, hundreds, even thousands of students will come out to hear a debate on who was Jesus or does God exist? Because students today are suspicious of uh, Christian speakers. They want there to be a level playing field where passionate representatives of both sides are given an equal opportunity to share their views. And so my debate uh, with Lawrence Krauss in Melbourne and Sydney and Brisbane and Adelaide were attended by thousands of people. And the purpose of these debates is to reach the people in the audience, especially people who do not yet have a religious faith, and to get them to think about these things. A lot of people misunderstand. They think that the purpose of the debate is to try to win over your opponent, to persuade your opponent. That's not the purpose. He's there simply to help draw an audience. It is the people in the audience that I'm trying to reach through these debates by showing them that a Christian world and life view is an intellectually defensible option for thinking men and women today. Have you had many stories of people afterwards in terms of debates telling you that that was really a, a big step for them in being more open to the God question? We get letters like this uh, at reasonablefaith.org from people who have attended debates. It doesn't usually happen the same evening, though that can happen. It's more a cumulative effect uh, where they begin to watch these debates, and then they see more, and then they watch more, and then they begin to explore for themselves. And it's part of a sort of cumulative process that does bring many people to faith or back to faith after a period of unbelief. And I've noticed that particularly in the question of the week that you have on your website. I think this is a, a brilliant thing. People send in letters or questions, mm -hmm. and then you usually type out uh, somewhat of a succinct response. But many of those letters often express stories of people who have been impacted by reading your books or watching your lectures uh, online or through watching some of these debates. And so write in to say, thanks, this has been really helpful for me in these ways. Yeah. I'm wrestling with these doubts. That's that's kind of a cool story. It, it, I mean, yeah, it, it's so heartwarming. And so many of these people have then gone on to do graduate studies themselves in philosophy or theology or enter the ministry or become a professor. Uh, the, the reverberating effect is just enormous uh, through the lives of these people. That's exciting. Hey, and you had a conversation uh, a couple of years back now with some um, Jordan Peterson and, uh, and yeah. another sort of secular thinker. I've forgotten her name, sorry. Um, Rebecca uh, but on. Yes, that's right. That's right. Uh, on just the theme of meaning and is there meaning in this life? And, and I'm curious what you think of the sort of meteoric rise of someone like a Jordan Peterson figure who mm -hmm. seems to be more of a, a bridge between an entirely irreligious world, but then thinking that there is value to believing that, that God might be yeah. real, living as though God exists. Do you think it's the erosion of the Judeo-Christian worldview and story that guided the sense of meaning and purpose that many people had in our Western culture that sort of brought up these symptoms now amongst younger people for a real hunger for spiritual things, a real hunger for uh, search for meaning. How, what do you make of that? Yes, well, I think it's quite definitely true that the result of modern secularism has been a deterioration in belief in the objectivity of meaning and value and purpose in life. Uh, for someone with a naturalistic worldview, really, the world is a terrible place, filled with gratuitous evil, destined to extinction in the heat death of the universe, having no ultimate meaning or, or, or purpose, everything determined by physical causes. Uh, and so I am very, very grateful to a Jordan Peterson for the way in which he raises these issues in the minds of secular university students and gets them to think about it. And he has been so sympathetic to 
a, a Christian perspective on these issues that I do think his work can form a kind of natural bridge from secularism to Christian faith. Yeah, and I, th I think there's that uh, element for a lot of younger people where they'll look at someone like him and say, because he has more of a therapeutic currency, you know, he's a trained yes. psychiatrist, he doesn't come yeah. necessarily with the religious label. And so they're like, oh, this, this may actually just be good for us. I don't know whether it's true, but it may just be good for us. And that seems to play a lot into uh, the acceptable uh, persuasive currency of our moment right now. Um, I'd love to do a bit of a quick fire round if we can to throw a few questions at you for our sort of sub one minute answers. And this is more right. for people to get a sense of uh, what you think the, the sort of state of uh, the Christian secular conversation is. Um, so question, uh, what is your favorite argument for God? It would be the Kalam cosmological argument, which goes like this. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist Therefore, the universe has a cause. And then you do an analysis of what it is to be a cause of the universe, and it uh, turns out to be a beginningless, uncaused, immaterial, timeless, spaceless, enormously powerful personal creator of the universe. So good. Uh, and there's, there's all, uh, a lot more you can dive into reasonable faith to be able to pick up the, see him pass that out. Uh, next question, uh, what do you think is the most powerful argument against belief in God? Well, I don't think that it's the problem of evil, which is what most people would probably say. For me, the most powerful argument against God that I've ever encountered arises from the philosophy of Platonism. Platonism is the philosophy that there are uncreated, abstract objects, like mathematical objects, like numbers, shapes, and, pro uh, and uh, um, other sorts of mathematical entities, propositions, properties, and so forth. And if these things are, actually exist as Platonists think, then that means that God is not the sole ultimate reality, that he is not the creator and source of all being. And that would be profoundly contrary to the Christian world and life view. So I spent 13 years uh, with this as my focus in my research uh, and, and wound up writing a book called God and Abstract Objects, in which I propose a solution to this challenge posed by Platonism. Great. Uh, what argument do you wish atheists would stop using? Well, there are lots of bad arguments, but I think they should stop using the argument that Jesus of Nazareth never existed. That is just indefensible, the sort of mythological Jesus, that he's just a mythological figure. Uh, no credible historical scholar or New Testament scholar holds to uh, such a view, it is indisputable that Jesus of Nazareth was a living flesh and blood person as real as Julius Caesar or Alexander the Great. And in fact, we know a good deal about the life and the teachings of this man. So these, these silly arguments that Jesus never existed really need to cease. Yeah. And if you could give one piece of advice to 20-year-old Bill, what would that be? Well, this would be the same advice that I would give to any other 20-year-old single man. I would say, devote your life entirely to knowing and serving Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Keep yourself pure from sin, and if and when you marry, marry a woman who will partner with you in the ministry to which God has called you, so that you will not grow apart as the years go by, but rather you will be united together um, in serving Him. There you go. That's interesting advice um, to be able to, to 
ponder on. Uh, well, let's dive a little bit more into some of your specific work because we had a ton of questions come in uh, through our social media channels uh, when we said this interview was going to take place. We've just come out of Easter, as we mentioned, and on, on our channel, we spent a fair bit of time trying to help people wrestle with why is it necessary that Jesus die in order for God to forgive. So if you're watching this and that's a question, um, jump on and check out our short sort of seven minute video on that. But Bill, you've done a lot of work on the concept of atonement, how Jesus' death brings us back into relationship with God. You've written a rather lengthy volume on this subject, as well as a more popular level book. I've got both of them over here. And I'm curious if you had two minutes with someone who's maybe a newcomer to Christianity to explain the meaning of the cross, what would you say? I would say that the doctrine of the atonement is like a jewel. It has many facets to it. And gemologists call the central facet of a gem or jewel, the table. And I would say the table of the doctrine of the atonement, its central facet, is the doctrine of penal substitution. That is to say that on the cross, Jesus bore the suffering that I deserved as the punishment for my sin, thereby freeing me of my liability to punishment. That, I think, is the heart of the doctrine of the atonement. That's very succinct and helpful. We uh, did a series of videos, sort of one-minute clips on different facets in the lead-up to Easter on uh, on that, on our channel. So I love that image of the diamond. It's so helpful. Um, recently, you were on uh, friend Justin Briley's podcast, Unbelievable, and doing something similar to this, answering a series of questions, but they were ones that were given in live. And uh, you touched on your work uh, more recently in the study of the historical Adam and Eve and how you think that traces back to uh, sort of the Homo heidelbergensis, uh, um, common ancestor of Neanderthals and then of Homo sapiens. Um, you mentioned in this study that that shifted your perspective to think mm -hmm. that human beings were created initially mortal by God, but had access to ongoing biological life through, uh, through then the um, Garden of Eden. I'm curious whether that has also impacted any of your beliefs around human beings at the end. Uh, so the concept of final judgment and your views on hell, whether there's any correlation there. No, I don't think there is a correlation. The fact that human beings were created with mortal physical bodies says nothing about the immortality of their souls. Uh, and so I am inclined to believe on the basis of New Testament teaching that when a person's physical body dies, his soul survives the death of the body and either goes to be with Christ um, to await Christ's return and the final resurrection or else is separated from God until that final judgment day. So there is a kind of intermediate disembodied state between our physical death and our physical resurrection. So you think the New Testament supports the idea of the immortality of all people into uh, sort of the forever? Yes, this was the traditional Jewish view uh, at the time. This is the inherited uh, legacy of, of Judaism that uh, the souls of the departed dead, whether righteous or unrighteous, are preserved until the day of judgment. And then resurrection will come, judgment will come, and then people will receive their final dessert. But uh, Jews did not believe that people were simply extinguished uh, when uh, they died physically. Now, there were some that believed that, I should say, but that wasn't the, the mainstream view. And in the New Testament, I think it's very clear that Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 contemplates going through this intermediate disembodied state um, mm -hmm. and how uncomfortable this makes him. Uh, he calls it a state of nakedness and, and says he would rather receive his resurrection body uh, immediately without having to go through this intermediate state. But nevertheless, his desire is to depart and be with Christ so that even though the intermediate state is not the optimal state, it's still better than this world. Yeah, I think that whole discussion of what human beings are in terms of embodied, in terms of a mind, in terms of a soul and all that is a, is a fascinating and rich one. Is there an area of your work that you'd encourage people to read more around that? 
I have done a little bit of that in connection with my philosophical uh, systematic theology that I'm writing when I okay. treat the incorporeality of God. Because when you think about what God is, God is a sort of unembodied soul. He is a mental or spiritual substance without a body. And so many of the same arguments about body-soul dualism would apply to uh, the existence of God as an incorporeal being. He's not disembodied, but he's, he's unembodied. Mm. All right, well, watch this space then for the release of that. Um, but for those who haven't heard before, so Bill's working on a big That's project. Going to be uh, a long time away, I'm afraid. Yeah. Uh, I don't even have a, a contract on it yet for, with a publisher, so I, I'm still waiting. Yeah. But uh, systematic philosophical theology, would, would you say that's the first of its kind? In modern times, yes. Now, when you look at medieval theologies like Thomas Aquinas or jo John Dunn Scotus or more mm. recently than that, Francisco Suarez, these were systematic philosophical theologies. But in the contemporary uh, era, they're as rare as hen's teeth. The only thing that would possibly come close might be Paul Tillich's systematic theology, which is heavily philosophical. But you see, Tillich wrote before and independently of the revolution in Anglo-American philosophy that has brought the tools of analytic philosophy to the service of theology, and which has just revolutionized everything. So <laughs> this would be the first systematic treatment since that revolution in analytic philosophy has transpired in the late 20th century. Yeah, I think there's a lot of people looking forward to just seeing what shape that will take and, uh, and how that'll help people think through the issues that, that we're facing today. Um, one, one thing in our kind of cultural moment, there's been a, a real shift in the last 20 years, and, and maybe you're experiencing as much in Australia as we are here, um, uh, in America as we are here in Australia. We're probably a, a little bit further along the line in terms of the secularization yeah. experience. But there are some who contend that the declining numbers of people who believe in God and even the more hostile dynamics in the sort of post-everything age, post-Christian, post-modern, uh, should spark Christians to shift our tactics in how we actually talk about Christianity and our faith, and that we should be swapping out this apologetic persuasion for either a harder-edged proclamation, just tell them what the gospel says, uh, or more of a vision of conscious embodied witness. So just do the loving deeds of the gospel, and that'll have an impact. I'm curious in your response to those sorts of moves. Do you think the age of apologetics is over, or is it alive and well? I think that the line of thought that you describe is based upon a drastic misdiagnosis of contemporary Western culture. We do not, in fact, live in a postmodern age. Uh, when you ask people what they're relativistic about, they're relativistic about ethics and religion. But you see, that's not postmodernism. That's old line modernism, which says that science and technology and engineering give us the objective truth about reality, and ethics and religion are just matters of personal opinion or emotional feelings. So I am convinced that our Western culture remains at root deeply, deeply modernist, and that therefore to abandon our best arguments of logic and evidence, and just to share our narrative would be a disaster. It would be to capitulate. Um, if we do that, then our message will just be one more voice in a cacophony of competing voices, each one sharing its narrative, and none of them having a claim to the objective truth about reality. So we dare not uh, abandon the appeal to logic and objective evidence if we want to have an impact upon Western culture. Yeah, I resonate with that in a big way, particularly doing Q&As with teenagers and with university students, just that hunger to try and make sense of reality and whether or not the Christian story stacks up. So um, yeah, I appreciate the insights on there and even just in how to frame uh, that sort of a question. Uh, over your lifetime, you would have seen some huge shifts in terms of where Christianity fits in terms of the credibility of 
academic thinkers. You, you've described before a renaissance in Christian philosophy. I think it was maybe 20 years ago now, Quentin Smith, an atheist philosopher, lambasted his colleagues for giving up too much ground huh. to the theists yeah. in the world of world of philosophy. And, and yet, even despite maybe the advances that people like yourself and Richard Swinburne and Elvin Plantinger have made in helping to offer a defense of the Christian story, it still seems like there is this declining number of young people, particularly, yeah. who are sort of open to belief in God. There are spiritual hungers, a search for meaning, but still declining numbers of those who identify as Christian generation on generation. So I'm wondering if uh, you spoke before around the, the role that debate plays perhaps in university campuses, but what do you think needs to happen in order to help expose Generation Z and Alpha, the young adults and teenagers uh, of today, to be able to see the truth of the Christian story and why it's worth believing. Somehow we need to get these goods down out of the ivory tower where they are well defended in fields like philosophy, New Testament studies, physics, and so forth, and get them into the hands of lay people and students on a level they can understand. We're trying to do this at Reasonable Faith by making these short animated videos on these various arguments for the truth of the Christian faith. But it does seem to me that we need popularizers, uh, people like Lee Strobel and Greg Kokel uh, and Frank Turek and many, many others to take this material and put it out on the popular level um, where it will reach the masses. Unfortunately, my experience is that students today don't read much. They prefer to watch videos, uh, and so they'll never pick up a book like Reasonable Faith or even The Case for Christ. Uh, and so we've got to figure out how to get the message to people in a medium that they enjoy using and that they will uh, take the time to, to look at. Uh, I think we've got to, to to bring these goods down to that level. You haven't considered doing TikTok dances to be able to do that, Bill? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we probably won't see that playing out, but it is interesting to me that that's a number one platform that teenagers are going to to ask their spiritual questions and for religious content. And so I completely agree with that diagnosis, the, no. the need to be able to translate these meaningful ideas and explanations, even of the Christian story, to help deal with those common misconceptions. But to, yeah, to get we, we've out, got out the there. Good. We, we've got the material. It's just a matter of, of getting it before the eyes of these students. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, so w one of the other areas of your work that you're well known for is a proponent of Molinism, which is something of a, not via media, but a, a different alternative to the simple Arminian foreknowledge idea of God and then the classic mm -hmm. reformed vision of uh, sort of the doctrines of grace and uh, view of God's sovereignty and Calvinism. Um, and maybe you'd like to spell that out a, a little bit in a sec, but I remember doing a paper on this uh, in England on Molinism and looking at all of the various philosophical objections to middle knowledge, mm -hmm. but particularly the, the fruitfulness of yeah. this as a solution in the various oh. theological mysteries that the Christian story raises, uh, whether it's petitionary prayer or whether it's uh, the questions of the unevangelized. There's a whole lot of uh, ranges of area that this is in. We had a lot of questions come in around Molinism. And so um, there's one that I'd love to ask you. Um, uh, how uh, sort of much do you want to be a proponent of this potential solution to reconciling God's divine knowledge and sovereignty with human freedom? Oh, I think that it, it does reconcile divine sovereignty and human freedom. According to the middle knowledge position, God not only knows everything that could happen and everything that will happen, but he also has this knowledge of what would happen under any set of circumstances that you might imagine. And so by knowing how people would freely choose in any set of circumstances God places them in, God can be providentially in charge of a world of free creatures without abridging or abusing their freedom. He simply knows what circumstances to place people in, knowing how they would freely choose 
in those circumstances. And so this is a beautiful reconciliation of divine sovereignty uh, and human freedom, and it also gives God foreknowledge of the future, because knowing his own decree to create people in certain circumstances, and then having knowledge of how they would freely choose if placed in those circumstances, immediately he has knowledge of future free acts of people. Have you seen the uh, Avengers series with uh, Infinity Wars and Endgame and the Doctor Strange character knowing all the alternative possible futures? And what do you think of that? Do you think that's a, a good representation of Molinism? I, I've only seen, I think, one of the original Doctor Strange movies. You okay. see, um, Biola University that I'm affiliated with is out in Southern California and has a strong film program. And I was told that it was a Biola student who was familiar with Molinism who helped to write that Doctor Strange uh, movie and character exploiting middle knowledge and, and Molinistic motifs. But I, I didn't enjoy the film. I, I think that <laughs> contemporary films are just too filled with special effects and so little professional acting that they're just not of much interest anymore. Uh, we've got a, a future career in Dr. Craig reviews for movies, so we might have to jump down that at one yeah, point. Um, one, of, one, of, one of the questions yeah, we had come... <laughs> <laughs> One of the questions we had come in as well is just what what is the vision of sovereignty when it comes to Molinism? Uh, what kind of sovereignty does God express? Mm -hmm. What it means is that everything that happens happens by either God's direct will or his permission. Nothing happens that is not either directly willed by God or permitted by God to happen. That's a really useful definition. Um, and uh, in terms of a personal goal, you've spoken particularly about wanting to finish your, this philosophical theology. Um, but in terms of your career, uh, you've been involved with Biola and the Talbot School of Theology and developing all of these vast resources. Um, as you stare down the later years of life, the last few decades, uh, how important does the Christian story become in terms of the personal theme of hope. Uh, you spoke before how, um, you know, the problem of suffering tends to be a big mm -hmm. struggle for many people, and you speak to the emotional and the intellectual sides of that, but uh, what does the, the Christian story mean to you as you look back on yeah. all the work that you've done, and then you look forward at, at what's yet to come? You know, one of the things that impelled me to become a Christian as a teenager was the prospect of death and the absurdity of life that ensues from my death. Uh, and so right from the very beginning, the prospect of immortality, eternal life, and a loving relationship with God was one of the things that most attracted me to Christianity. It meant that every day that I wake up, my life is filled with activities of eternal significance. Uh, mm. And that enables you to live a joyful and meaningful life right now. Mm. And my heart's burden and prayer as I grow older now is that I would finish well. You know, so many people don't finish well, from people like Solomon in the Bible to Christian leaders that we know today. Uh, and I'm acutely aware of my own fallibility and frailty. And so I, I just pray that the Lord will help me, like Paul, to run the race to the finish line and to finish well. Yeah, well, we, we pray that uh, his presence give you that strength and wisdom and ability to do that. And I think there's a lot of people that are just profoundly thankful for the impact that you've had on their life in terms of just faithful mm -hmm. teaching and defense of the Christian story and to do that in a way that honors the Lord uh, in terms of his his character and the gentleness and subversion and, and humility that's there. Um, Bill, just want to, to jump on one last question and just say if you were to have a parting message to anyone who's watching this who might be considering Christianity, what would it be? Uh -huh. I would tell that person that Christianity is true. God really does exist, and he loves you and has sent his son to redeem you 
from your moral evil and, and failures and to forgive you and bring you into an eternal relationship of incomprehensible joy. Uh, and therefore, do not shut him out. Um, look into this. I would encourage you to pick up a New Testament and begin to read the Gospels mm -hmm. about the life of Jesus and ask yourself, could this really be true? Could there really be a God who loves me like this and has sent his son to die for me? And I believe if you'll do that, it, could, it can change your life in the same way that it changed mine. That's beautiful. Uh, and Bill, thanks so much for coming on the channel just to be willing to sit in the hot seat and field so many questions. Uh, I'm sure it's going to spark a big conversation and a lot more to follow, but it's been a real joy to have you on the channel. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure. Well, that's the end of this episode of QC Conversations. Just wanted to say a big thanks again to Dr. Craig, and you'll find a link to all of the resources that we've discussed, to his website, reasonablefaith.org, uh, to the various courses that you can pick up with his Defenders classes, to the books, and particularly to those Reasonable Faith animated videos. Just check out in the show notes to get links to all of those. If you're brand new to our channel here at Questioning Christianity, we're all about helping you rethink uh, and connect the Christian story to life's deepest questions. And so please do subscribe, hit the our bell on YouTube to get notifications and then go ahead and follow us all our social media accounts where we take all of these videos, our short form, long form conversations, and then break them down with a whole range of resources. So we'd love to get you connected. If you're interested in supporting the channel, uh, then please do jump on our website and check the support tab. But until next time, as always, truth mm -hmm. invites questioning. See you later. Dan here from Questioning Christianity. Thanks so much for checking us out. We are all about helping you connect the Christian story to life's deepest questions. So if you're enjoying the content, make sure you subscribe and click the bell on YouTube and then go ahead and follow us on socials.